at the real beginning, I just wanted to try what, what's going on when I use a flute or my voice or drums. How does it? How do I react on what I'm doing with any any sort of instrument or any sort of noise? So it was not music at all that influenced me, or not 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 any style or not any any trend. I just was so curious to to work with noise and, and sounds and tones to become aware what's what what's that? What's music? What has it? Uh, I mean, what's the ground in it? Uh, how should it be? And needing a rehearsal and performance space, Schnitzer and Rodelius began to rent part of a theatre. This room eventually became the Zodiac Free Arts Lab. We had this room and we made a lot of... Uh, Boris and Achim, they bought some new instruments, you know, for no caching, for caching later. <laughs> you know, because it was all so uh, really fantastic. Yeah, we played there two, three days, nobody came. Of course not, we made no advertising for nothing. Nobody knows us, nobody knows what was going on there. So, we, I, and the first, uh, what we was, our group was called Geräusche, means noises, you know. And I had the small, tiny uh, papers and with a stamp, and we, a hundred of, of these papers, we stamped and we give them as flying, papers around and where was a, uh, if there was somewhere a, a, a concert of modern music like in the area of the um, uh, television station is it now yes uh, radio SFB and the people came out and uh, give them the paper or there was Emerson Lake and Palmer somewhere playing we put this papers around and it was really dark also there and you saw the papers flying and so, afterwards, there was coming people. And then we invite also other musicians, groups, but not normal groups. Sometimes they, they, they want some, somebody plays who just played music from other groups, you know. We didn't want it, we want something what was experimental. And so there came, like, Schulze with his group came, and, of course, Edgar came back, and I was... Uh, with Edgar already in, in, a, in a connection, you know, and he came with his group, and so we had, uh, it was full of equipment, everything, you know, Every, we, we didn't move, remove this, it was forever there, and only the groups who was then on the end in have the right to play there every evening, what means after the theater was to the end, we, because otherwise it was too loud, you know. And the Zodiac became a hive of activity. Where rock had previously been the typical music emerging from the city, now an underground began to form that would draw the most daring musicians to it. Rock music konnte in Berlin nicht so florieren. Uh, Rockbands lösten sich relativ schnell auf. Geld war nicht. Dann war diese Free Jazz Szene sehr einflussreich. Und am Anfang mischte sich das auch. Und zwar ausgerechnet in diesem Club, den Konrad aufgemacht hatte. Im Zodiac spielten Leute, die heute große Namen im improvisierten Jazz sind, wie Brötzmann, Irene Schmalzer, Schlippenbach. Manche Leute wechselten von einem Genre zum anderen, wie Uli Trepte, der äh, im Trio mit Irene Schwarzer spielte, also Jazz, und dann zu Guru Guru ging also einer richtigen Krautrock-Band. Diese Szene war da sehr, sehr durchlässig. Everything was allowed, even smoking joints. So nobody, it was really free, free, free uh, atmosphere. There were many projects, but the Zodiac was the first nucleus of, of where everybody came together. It was sort of nest. And out of the Zodiac, many, many different groups really became aware of themselves. Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schultz, all these guys, they studied themselves in the Zodiac. I think in every city, it is like uh, you're always looking at a room where you can make loud music, you know, and the Zodiac, it was uh, under a big theater, and uh, there was also a, a pub next to it, and uh, there was a big room where the owner said, you know, here you can play there, you know. 
And uh, then we just, yeah, we played a, a couple of bands like Cluster uh, and pl Plus Minus was a big beginning where Schnitzler was also there. And there was Tension Dream there. Then was I was with my band with Psy Free. But it was a nice kind of, let's say, kind of a factory for bands. So then uh, we got, let's say, a bit known through that in Berlin. And then comes uh, people from other clubs and they said, can you play uh, the same thing uh, in our, my club or in our club? And so we, it started long time, but we, uh, slowly, but we were really like to totally underground. Lowest underground, when <laughs> you say like this, you know. This experimentation was not only occurring in Berlin, however. In Munich, radical art commune Amon Dool was established in 67, and it quickly developed a reputation for its musical performances. Like at the Zodiac, the emphasis was on free form structures and improvisation, and the commune had a similar perspective on artistic freedom, valuing enthusiasm and attitude over technical ability. As they began to tour the country, it became clear that Amandul were a very different proposition than the Anglo-American influenced pop bands. Amandul was, was this uh, already this myth and uh, legend dairy band when they existed. I mean, you had rumors all over Germany because if they played somewhere, this was so different. They came with their children, they came with their wives. They, you never knew uh, what the lineup is. Yeah, if they play with four people or with twenty, they always had fights on stage, behind stage, and uh, this was nothing uh, you really expected from a city like Munich. The first music clubs after the war and in the 60s even when uh, already Amundul uh, started have been uh, American GI clubs where they played soul and black music so in Munich you had a huge community of German musicians interpreting American soul yeah so, of course, this was a really break Amundu. That was really completely different. For me, it was like um, now we, we, we were starting to build our own uh, musical identity in Germany, taking influences from all parts and also German influences. Amandus always had a, well, a strange affection to their Bavarian past, to the end that they released an album in 74, I think, uh, where they posed in King Ludwig's uh, habit and things like that and, and sang about uh, him and, and about the Bavarian past as a kingdom. So in the late 60s it was, uh, it was an alternative scene because they, they mixed things and they did jazzy things, they did uh, very daring things, if I may say so. Uh, they didn't just copy anymore until 67 it was let's try to do a nice beat band sound or let's try to copy the, the British bands. The big magazines picked up on them because of the wildness yeah, of the image. It was really something very interesting, exotic. And this new innovative approach to music would spread through Germany. In the far west of the country, the Rhein-Ruhr area, comprising cities Cologne and Dusseldorf, yet another scene began to emerge. Both cities had their fair share of beat bands and cover acts, but they also had thriving artistic scenes. In Cologne, Can formed, a group who would become one of the leading lights of the German movement. And in Dusseldorf, future craftwork pioneers Ralf Hutter and Florian Schneider founded the organization. When I think of Kraftwerk and or organization and the whole scene around them, the, the, the things that would come to my mind as forerunners would not be in the field of music, but in the field of uh, fine art, visual art. Uh, I think the Düsseldorf scene at the 60s was, very, was a very vibrant scene uh, based around this uh, place, this club called Cream Cheese, 
which was very important, which was a nightclub, a, a discotheque, decorated and, and organized by people from the Zero Movement, which was a kind of very important movement, and, and other artists around. The Düsseldorf, the Düsseldorf Art Academy was there, uh, where uh, people like Josef Beuys were uh, teaching at that time. And, uh, and this is far more, for me, the, the culturally important background. Yet although there was a major influence from the world of the visual arts, there was also a more academic element to these bands. Unlike the various artists from the Zodiac scene or those in Amon Dul, the organizations Florian Schneider and Ralph Hutter and Cannes Holger Schukai and Ermin Schmidt were classically trained musicians. And classical music itself had been going through some radical changes since the 1930s, with various composers striving to introduce an electronic component into it. A major figure in the introduction of new sounds and electronic techniques in this area was Frenchman Pierre Schaeffer. Pierre Schaeffer was imported in France because he had a studio in, uh, in Radio France. Most of the early electronic studios were in radio stations uh, in the mid 19, late 1940s, mid 1950s because they had the equipment. The equipment they were using was basically tone generators, oscillators, sine wave generators, very basic sound equipment that produced, um, that changed sound waves. And then they didn't have tape. Pierre Schaeffer's early, early um, experiments with music were, were discs from records. What he did was he actually got records, 78s uh, of, of, say, train sounds, water sounds, crowd sounds, marching band sounds and mixed them together and, and invented this thing called music concrete or re real music. The main instrument that he used in the beginning was a record player and then when he was given access to a tape recorder he um, it totally revolutionised the way he worked, and so he was used, He was one of the first people, really, to uh, to use technology within a musical system, with, with a, as a as a really major part of a musical system, and obviously this influenced many uh, students of his, such as Pierre Henri and people like that, and later on Stockhausen. And it was this towering figure of experimental music operating out of the Rhine-Ruhr area itself who would become a pivotal influence on emerging electronic musicians. Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, who had collaborated with Pierre Schaeffer in the early 1950s, developed a music that would not only incorporate concrete elements, but also pure electronics. The groundbreaking compositions that he created while working at the WDR Broadcasting Center's electronic studio in Cologne during the 1950s and 60s would dramatically change the shape of late 20th century music. Stockhausen is by far the most important um, uh, composer of the 20th century in regards to electronic music because he invented the electronic music. I remember before Stockhausen there was no proper electronic music. Uh, people did not think about making e uh, electronic, just music electronically as a composition, writing it out, scoring it then composing it in the studio and then presenting it through loudspeakers. Nobody had the gall to do that, but he did. And he spent, would spend up to six months, maybe a year, putting together a half an hour piece or a 20 minute piece, either in Paris with Pierre Schaeffer or in Cologne, where he worked in, in this studio there. And Stockhausen had to start to get a lot of people following him. And after 1956, when he did Gesang de Jünlinger, which is Song of the Youth, and that was a massive international sensation because it was basically loudspeakers on stage and him just playing a tape. There was no, there was no musicians. This was scandalous. This was ridiculous. The classical establishment said, this is crazy, but this really caused a huge uproar. Yeah. 